And good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it's great to be back in, in Moscow, especially in this nice uh, weather and uh, this nice venue. Uh, I'm also very happy to be able to share with you um, some of the research we've done over the last years on uh, sulfuric acid catalysis. So today I'm going to show you some results from our uh, in situ studies uh, on sulfuric acid catalysis uh, uh, from uh, the laboratories of Haldotopso. Um, Haldotopso has been active in the sulfuric acid industry for more than 70 years, uh, both as a supplier of catalyst uh, and technology. Uh, and as you can see, we started with the sulfuric acid catalysts during World War II, and since then we've developed uh, a lot of different formulations and uh, sizes and shapes to uh, match the requirements in the market. We've also developed our own sulfuric acid technology and that's called the WSA technology. It stands for wet gas sulfuric acid because it can handle wet gases which the normal process cannot. Uh, and with this WSA process we can actually convert all sorts of of uh, sulfurous uh, waste streams and uh, off gases in industry into a commercial grade sulfuric acid uh, without uh, producing any waste or wastewater and we'll also produce some uh, valuable high pressure steam. Of course the process also uses our catalysts, a special series of catalysts that we've developed for the wet gases. Uh, this process is very versatile and it has been implemented in a lot of, di lot of different industries, as I've shown here, both for, for uh, in the, the refineries and in the uh, chemical industry, metallurgical industry, and a, a lot of other uh, industries. The topic of my uh, talk today will be uh, about how we use uh, advanced in situ studies uh, of catalysis and also numerical uh, modeling to predict and improve sulfuric acid catalyst performance in the industrial plants. So if we take a closer look at the sulfuric acid uh, catalyst and the way we work with catalyst development, some of this uh, you have uh, heard in the previous talks that it's very much based on the philosophy of uh, Dr. Haller Topso himself, that we built on applied fundamental research of the catalysts in their uh, industrial environments to be able to improve the catalysts. So from the fundamental understanding and the industrial experience, we uh, are able to improve the catalyst performance in the industrial plants. The sulfuric acid catalyst may look like this, and uh, the purpose is to oxidize SO2 to SO3, which is a reversible exothermic reaction, and uh, the catalysts, they are uh, based on a silica carrier, and the silica comes from diatomaceous earth. You can see a single diatomaceous earth particle here. And uh, the active components are vanadium oxides and uh, alkali metal sulfates. However, it's a quite a special catalyst, and the only one we have in Haldotsop, so that's a supported liquid phase catalyst. So this means that if you look closer into the catalyst, in cold condition, you will see the crystals of the active phase uh, in, in this condition, and they will, uh, they will be uh, present in that state. However, when the catalyst is put on stream uh, in synthesis gas in industry, the vanadium oxides will be dissolved in a pyrosulfate melt that covers the internal surface area of the catalyst. So you can see the sulfates here of the alkali metals will take up SO3 to form uh, pyrosulfate and dipyrosulfate. The pyrosulfate will melt and cover the, the catalyst surface and the vanadium oxides will be dissolved in this melt. So actually, under operating conditions, about one third of the catalyst mass in a sulfuric acid converter is liquid. But the liquid is kept inside the catalyst pellets due to capillary forces. Uh, this uh, has been known for many years and it was also shown conclusively by Haldotopso himself and co-workers in 1948. They did this uh, 
uh, experiment, and you can see this old school equipment here, where they circulated in this setup 14 weight percent vanadium pentoxide in potassium pyrosulfate. They fed SO2 and oxygen to the setup, and they saw a very high degree of conversion to SO3 uh, in, in this, showing that the carrion itself contributes to disperse the melt, but the silica is not part of, of the, the catalytic reaction as such. Since then, many research groups have uh, worked on uh, the understanding the mechanism and the complex chemistry taking place in this system, and we've come uh, far, but it's of course not all understood yet. Uh, for in the, in the 60s, Mars and Messon proposed a redox mechanism that was uh, discussed for, for many years where you can see the SO2 is oxidized to SO3, vanadium is reduced, and then vanadium is reoxidized afterwards by oxygen. However, later studies uh, showed that this could not be uh, the governing mechanism for this uh, catalyst. And many of them done by Boreskov and co-workers uh, around 1970. And uh, here's one example of how they could show from uh, transient kinetic studies uh, and uh, magnetic resonance techniques that this could not be the case. So here we can see curve 2, that's the rate of SO2 oxidation, this one, and the curve 1, that's the rate of vanadium-5 reduction. But if this was the mechanism, they should be equal, and you can see they're not at all. So this could not be the case, and instead uh, it was proposed that the main mechanism was an associative cycle, which is uh, widely accepted today, uh, shown here in a simplified form. So uh, in this catalytic cycle, you can see that uh, all the active species, they are uh, based on vanadium in oxidation state 5, uh, and they are dimeric uh, vanadium oxosulfato complexes uh, forming the catalytic cycle. Uh, however, not all vanadium in, a, in this catalyst is in oxidation state 5. Uh, so depending on the conditions, some of the vanadium is reduced to vanadium 4, shown by this branch, uh, especially at high partial pressure of SO2, low temperature, uh, a lot of the vanadium will re be reduced to vanadium 4, and some of it can precipitate out as solid uh, vanadium 4 compounds. It's not a deactivation as such, uh, but an equilibrium that adjusts uh, for a particular ca uh, catalyst system and uh, operating conditions. Uh, at some point, we did experiments where we quenched, quench cooled uh, uh, the catalyst directly from operating conditions, and then afterwards we measured the oxidation states, and we actually found that, uh, depending on temperature, uh, quite a lot of the vanadium was vanadium-4, of course, also quite a lot of vanadium-5, uh, but uh, certainly part of the vanadium is in the uh, state 4. So uh, one of the challenges for this catalyst is to maximize the content of vanadium-5 in the catalyst. So where are we today? Well, we have fundamental questions we would like to answer. So how can we optimize the gas-liquid interface? Uh, how is the, the wetting and the distribution of the active phase on uh, the carrier? Uh, what happens with vanadium oxidation states? Uh, what controls vanadium-4, vanadium-5? Um, can we understand the reaction mechanism and the detailed chemistry taking place? And what, are the, what, are, what is the role of the alkali metal promoters? You could not see them in the catalytic cycle. Uh, but they are the counter ions of the pyrosulfates, but uh, they also play a role for activity and performance. In order to uh, answer some of the, these questions, we have been using uh, some uh, in situ techniques over the recent years. So one is operando Raman spectroscopy, another is in situ transmission electron microscopy. And I will show you some of those results in the following. So let's first move to the the melt distribution, the dynamics of the active phase studied in situ in transmission electron microscopy. First, let's uh, take it on the lab scale and see what happens actually. Here we've uh, done a simple experiment. We 
have made a silica carrier that is uh, white. This is what you see, the white part of these pellets. And then we have impregnated partially with the active phase, which is yellow. Uh, so you can see here, this is impregnated, this is not. And if we make a line scan, uh, you can see the colors here, but you can also see that uh, we have vanadium in this part, and in the other part, this is effectively uh, zero. So what happens if we put it on stream in lab? Three days, then it looks like this. You can see that the vanadium has its yellow throughout the pellet, and you can see from this analysis that now vanadium is distributed all over the pellet. So this shows in a simple way that the melt is quite mobile and will distribute on the carrier depending on the operating conditions. But of course we want to, to see it on the nano scale. We want to see what takes place in the catalyst when it's operating. Uh, and this has been quite a challenge uh, because um, normally nobody wants to put sulfur in their microscopes because it will uh, corrode the microscopes and it's expensive equipment and it will also interfere with other experiments. So we decided in Topso to dedicate a microscope for these sulfur-related studies you can say we, we decided to sacrifice it because uh, now it's only for sulfur-related uh, studies. Um, it's special in the way also that we, we can operate with some millibar pressure of gas. A normal TEM operates maybe at 10 to the minus 9th uh, atmosphere pressure, but here we can operate at, say, 10 millibar gas pressure, which is quite close to industrial conditions. So in this case, we feed some SO2 and oxygen around the sample here, and you can see uh, that we have uh, put in a catalyst. This is a, a model catalyst, and the reason for using a model catalyst is because we want to, to see the, uh, uh, the basic phenomena taking place, and that's uh, more easy if we have a, a model catalyst. Here the silica is, uh, is round, 100 nanometer spheres, so-called Stoeber spheres, that we've used to to make this catalyst. So they are easy to identify. The way to maintain this gas pressure is to do use a differentially pumped vacuum system in the microscope, uh, and still then we can maintain the high resolution of the microscope. So here's one example where we uh, put in a catalyst uh, with five millibar SO2 partial pressure, five millibar oxygen, uh, and we put it in at uh, 450 degrees, and we'll see what happens from the uh, as prepared catalyst to when it's put on stream in the microscope. And uh, let's see if this works. So here you can see it as, as a function of time, uh, what happens on the nano scale. And um, one thing to observe is that in the cavities uh, between the silica particles, the melt seems to accumulate, which makes sense because it's the capillary action uh, taking uh, place to redistribute the melt. But another thing that we didn't uh, expect was that on the convex surfaces of the silica, we see something else building up, uh, and it seems to form some faceted particles uh, instead. So clearly there's something different in the convex and concave areas of the catalyst. So here we believe that what we see here, that's the active melt, the, especially the vanadium-5, the liquid melt, accumulating in the concave areas. And uh, the, uh, on the uh, convex areas, we see the faceted particles, and we think they are uh, vanadium-4 species precipitating out. Um, if we do the same at a higher temperature, 600 degrees, it's different. Uh, because we cannot really see all these details, uh, and we uh, think here that the liquid film is actually uniformly covering the silica. It's not disappeared, because if we bring it to 450, we will see the same. So it's still there, but it, it's more uniform. Uh, it makes sense uh, that we don't have the reduction in the precipitation at the high temperature. From these studies, we can, we can learn about the equilibrium distribution and in this way, we can tune the carrier systems we work with and improve the, the catalyst in this way. We can also learn about the melt migration rates, which will be very dependent on uh, especially temperature.
If we zoom out to the lab scale, industrial scale again, it has some implications that the melt is uh, more. Uh, this is different from the heterogeneous catalysts. Uh, if we plot here the catalyst activity uh, as a function of uh, the, the liquid loading, which is the, the fraction of the pore volume filled with the active phase, we see some proportional effects at low loading. But if we have high loading, we get uh, poor gas transport in the catalyst, and uh, then we get a lower activity. So there's a, a, an optimum liquid loading for this uh, catalyst system, and uh, more vanadium is not always better because you can actually get a lower activity if you overload. So this is overloaded. Uh, another thing that can happen in industry is that uh, dust deposits on the first bed in the converter it can look like this. When you open the converter, you can see the dust covering uh, the catalyst. Catalyst is quite sticky, and the dust, if it's very fine dust, can extract some of the uh, liquid from the catalyst. And in this way, uh, you will lose the active phase, and in the end, it will deactivate, and you need to replace the catalyst. So this is more on the, you can say, the practical uh, level, but we get the understanding from the in situ studies on how this works in detail. Let's uh, move to uh, from the, the physical characterization to the, the chemistry. And here we are using a, a unique technique we've developed uh, uh, on uh, Operando Raman. Um, the chemistry of the catalyst is also related or expressed in the colors. And uh, vanadium-5 has a, a nice yellow color and, color, and this is what uh, people in industry also likes to see this uh, yellow color. However, a lot of other color, colors can be found for vanadium species, uh, especially when it's reduced to vanadium-4. You can see green and, and, uh, and blue colors. And even if uh, the operators in the sulfuric acid industry does know that, in the first bed it will be not yellow when it's operating, but actually uh, more the other blue color. Um, however, it also depends on the moisture content of the catalyst. So it's tricky to use colors to say anything about a catalyst and its performance. Uh, other techniques uh, should be used for that. Um, in the Raman uh, spectroscopy, we're using a special fluid bed cell and this is to avoid laser-induced overheating. Uh, Raman tells about the chemical bonding in the sample, and it uses a high-power laser, so that will heat up the particles you're looking at, uh, and you may get some very uh, uh, wrong results when you interpret. But here we have a fluid bed uh, in this reactor, uh, so the catalyst crushed down to maybe 200 micron particles will move around and in this way, it will be isothermal and the temperature will be well known. Uh, here's an example where we are looking at, we're simulating the startup of a first bed uh, containing a VK38 catalyst. Uh, so first we, and you can see that's the, uh, looking into the, the fluid bed here. So first we look at the uh, Raman spectrum for the catalyst in air at 380 degrees, typically a condition before uh, process gas is introduced. And uh, that can be, the peaks can be identified to vanadium-5, dimers, and, and polymers in the catalyst. And it's also the, the yellow color. Uh, then let's try to, uh, to run the reactor. And here you can see the catalyst is moving around. And after some time, we will shift to the process gas, 10% SO2, 10% oxygen and when that happens you can see it visually on the catalyst as well that now it changes the yellow disappears and you uh, are left with a gray green uh, color instead this is quite obvious when you put on a different gas you get a different composition in one way so let's see if the ramen uh, agrees with that uh, for this situation and, and certainly you get a very different spectrum for uh, the catalyst at this operating condition uh, these peaks can be identified to uh, vanadium-4 species uh, and it clearly shows that when you introduce the, uh, the process gas uh, at uh, 380 degrees, the catalyst, uh, the vanadium is reduced to vanadium-4. Here we, uh, we see three steps of the, 
you can say the same experiment. Uh, so here we have three 80 degrees in air, and we identify this dimeric vanadium oxysulfate complex in the catalyst. When we shift to SO2 gas and have we have very low conversion as shown on this conversion measurement, we get the more green color and the reduced vanadium. When we heat it to 480 degrees, which is corresponds to maybe middle of a, a first bed in industry, we see again a yellow color and now we, we can find monomeric and dimeric uh, vanadium oxysulfate. As you say, it's, it's, it's uh, yellow, but it's a different yellow, so colors are tricky to say anything uh, about the, the composition. Another study would, we did was to investigate what is the effect of cesium as a promoter. Standard catalyst uh, uses uh, primarily potassium as uh, the promoter, and uh, we wanted to see what cesium does because cesium is, is used to boost activity at low temperature. And uh, here we've uh, done a similar experiment. We have two uh, commercial catalysts. One is uh, potassium promoted, one is cesium promoted. And we do the Raman spectra from 350 degrees up to 490, so this is increasing temperature. And uh, if we zoom in on the peaks related to vanadium-4, we will see that we get some very distinct peaks in the VK38, especially at the lower temperatures, we see the vanadium-4 compounds. However, they are almost not present in the VK59, which is cesium promoted. So uh, we find uh, in these studies that uh, the cesium stabilizes uh, linked vanadium-5 compounds, and in this way it uh, maintains vanadium in state 5 instead of uh, reducing to uh, oxidation state 4. Now we've looked at some of the fundamentals of the VK catalyst. Can we also use that to predict performance in a plant? In principle it's possible and people have done that to make uh, calculation models of the full mechanism that I've shown. However, you always end up in having so many parameters in these models that they lose their uh, significance. You cannot say what they mean, you can only fit them. So we want to go another way, and this is what I'll uh, talk about last here, how we uh, can predict transient catalyst behavior in sulfuric acid plants. Uh, this is a steady state operating curve for sulfuric acid plant, a textbook example. You can say you have temperature increase over each catalyst bed, and in this configuration, uh, it's a 3 plus 1 double absorption plant. After three beds, you re remove some of the SO3 product, and then you can shift the equilibrium further to the right. Uh, in this way, you get this blue equilibrium curve for bed four, and, and you can get to high conversion. And that's all very well, and we do that all the time. We design the converters, and we predict how much SO2 will be in the stack, which is important uh, for our clients. However, more focus is put on startup emissions, and emissions during yeah, startup, shutdown, feed change, and process offsets. Uh, and you can see an example here where the feed gas concentration changed quite a lot. And of course, the SO2 in the stack, the red one, did not remain the same. So this is challenging operating, uh, operating conditions for a plant. Uh, and we were wondering if we could not uh, help with that to say, how do you best operate the plant start up uh, and keep emissions down? The challenge for the operator, that is to start up as fast as possible and keep emissions low and uh, minimize fuel consumption. That's what they need to do. So we've built a more semi-empirical uh, model for this. And uh, what we want to have in the model, we want the catalytic reaction. That's, of course, uh, the main thing. But then we need also the formation of the pyrosulfates because uh, that will have a, a huge effect on on absorption desorption of SO2 and SO3, and also on heat and heat waves in the reactor because it's exothermic. Uh, and up to 10% of the catalyst mass may actually be absorbed and desorbed through these reactions. So it's a huge effect on the converter. So what we are doing here is that we have a steady state catalysis 
That's reaction one. We know that very well from uh, fallout catalysts. But then we have the reaction two, three, and four, and they are the unsteady contributions to the model. Uh, these two, they are the pyrosulfate and dipyrosulfate formation, and this one is the unsteady catalytic reaction, uh, which is actually very fast when the catalyst is deficient in sulfur compared to the operating conditions. Uh, the fluxes to the catalyst are given here. So the SO2 flux, that's reaction one and four, they consume SO2. The oxygen follows the SO2, that's a pseudo steady state approximation for the oxygen. And then we have the last one where we have the absorption desorption contribution of the SO3 going back and forth. Uh, when we are at steady state, uh, the rate of reaction four, and this term will be zero, and then we're back to the steady state model. So how, how have we used this? We have a few parameters that we have uh, fitted to lab scale, pilot scale, and industrial scale measurements. Here are two examples from the pilot scale. One example on the left is how the SO3 uh, is out of a bed one when the SO2 is shut off. So we run steady state until this point, then we stop for the SO2 feed. We still have nitrogen and oxygen going through, so we have the full gas volume, but no SO2 in there. And then we start the SO2 again here. You can see temperature drops. That's the green and blue one, one calculated, one measures. And, and then when we start up again, temperature rises again. That's well modeled in this case. You can also see there's a tailing of the SO3 coming off the, the bed one. With the red one, that's the measured, and the black one is the calculated curve. And we can do that quite well. The same goes for S2 on the right. A similar experiment, we shut off the S2 feed uh, here, and then we look at temperature, goes down, goes up, and you can see there's a small bump on the curve here. That's due to the uh, exothermic uh, uptake of the SO3 that will create a small heat wave in this case. That's also captured by the model. And we can see that the SO2 emissions shown by the red and black, it is also well modeled uh, for the pilot. So then we've used the model to, to say, how can we best operate a sulfuric acid plant? This is one case when a plant is shut down, it's normal to purge with air to get SO3 off the catalyst. And then you can see what happens when you start up the plant again, if you do it or if you don't do it. So here you can see how much SO3 comes off during purging. The blue one, you don't purge at all. So you have all the sulfur left in the catalyst. And then you can see the blue one on the right when you start up. Next time, you get a huge peak of maybe 1500 ppm SO2 going to the stack. However, if you purge, let's take the red one, purge at 450 degrees, you get a, a lot of SO3 off the catalyst during purging, and when you start up the next time, you will only have a very small peak in the stack. So in this way, we can calculate and derive better startup procedures, shutdown, purging, startup procedures for the plants. Another example is to use the cesium promoted catalyst, low temperature catalyst, to keep startup emissions down. In this case, a double absorption plant in industry, they had this startup emission, you can see if, as a function of time, some five, 600 ppm SO2 going to the stack uh, when they started up. However, they wanted to reduce bed temperatures because then they could start up faster. And that's, that's a good business for them if they can f start up faster and start production. Uh, so how could we reduce bed temperatures and have a faster startup? Well, we could put in a VK59, which is a cesium promoted catalyst, works better at low temperature. And we predicted this, this is a model calculation based on their startup data to say, if you put in this catalyst, you will get the, uh, the blue curve. They uh, installed the catalyst and uh, they measured uh, this uh, dark blue one, and you can see that's, that's not too bad predicted for this uh, plant's uh, startup. Of course, they could have kept the potassium promoted and just lowered temperatures, but the prediction will say that this is what they'll get. 
So they will get very high emissions if they just lower temperature because the catalyst is not active enough. So this is another way where we can say what is the best choice of catalyst in a, in a, in a, in a given situation for a given uh, start of a plant. Okay, that was another example of, you can say, the dynamics of the sulfuric acid catalyst, but here more on the uh, industrial scale, and uh, but still using the fundamental principles of the, the catalyst. So this brings me to my conclusion. So I've shown you now uh, how the sulfuric acid catalysts, they interact with the local gas environment, both vanadium oxidation states, melt distribution. And uh, we have observed the melt dynamics on the nanoscale for the first time. Uh, we see the color change when we change operating conditions, and this is due to primarily the, the, the vanadium oxidation states, and we've also found this vanadium, uh, the dimeric vanadium oxysulfato complex in there. Uh, we've shown that the cesium uh, rich samples, the cesium promoted catalyst, can hinder the formation of vanadium-4 and in this way uh, provide high activity at low temperature. Uh, and we've constructed a dynamic model, a semi-empirical model, to be able to predict not only what happens in lab, but what happens out in the real sulfuric acid uh, plant, which is what's important for, for our clients. And by this we can select the best catalyst and, uh, and uh, derive the best uh, operating procedures uh, during tr uh, transient operation of the plant. So with this, I think uh, uh, I will conclude my talk and, uh, and uh, thank you for your attention.